I guess for me, like something that I, I've done, and this has really helped me, is the first thing I've done is accept the fact that if I die, I most likely won't know that I died, right? Because let's say these things about these like, howdy. Yo, 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 how's it going, Mr. V-Man? Hmm, pretty okay, except my internet seems to be a little bit on the fritz today, so hopefully we don't have any issues with that. That's okay, man. Russian saboteurs are everywhere. Look behind every corner, man. There's a red everywhere these days. Unironically true. Red scare too, except this time it's good. How you doing? <laughs> red red scare too, electric boogaloo. I'm doing okay. I'm back from Ukraine. I'm back in the great state, the best state in the whole United States, Maryland, okay? I'm back in Maryland. It's fantastic to, you know, visit with family and and uh, see friends and relax a bit. Um, be able to use services like DoorDash and the ease of it is just uh, very nice. But it's also, it's weird readjusting. It's uh, it's difficult and all I can think about is going back. So I'm trying to head back in January or February. Jesus Christ, man. Um, well, I won't deter you, you know, I'm impressed by your bravery. Just uh, make sure to make sure to get some R&R &R before you head back into an active war zone, okay? Look, I I I am doing my best to relax, but there's the thing is, right? Um re rest and relaxation is important. Definitely when you're dealing with uh you know, situations like we were dealing with over there. Um extremely important. But the thing is is it's not like all just doom and gloom over there. Like you have buddies that you hang out with, you have like you drink with people, you eat with people. I used to go to this place around Kiev. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, I'd go to the front line anytime uh, I, I I needed to come back and just relax for like a week after like some weird stuff that happened or, you know, I just want to relax. I go to this compound that that's hosted by a friend of mine and it's like 100% renewable. They got solar panels and windmills designed by the family. 100% uh, renewable, and I could just sit there and watch pirated movies and, and get smoked up with legal legal substances, of course. And you could get smoked up and just relax for like a week or two before heading back out. And it was fantastic because it allowed me to kind of avoid a lot of the war fatigue that a lot of other people deal with. Yeah, I, oh man, you're feeling it, aren't you? This is the, this is the thing. It's like, it's dangerous over there, but people are alive as opposed to the, um, the, the, the banality of day-to-day -day life in, in the just-before-fascist uprising United States. I mean, to, to an extent, right? Like, there's more purpose over there. There has to be. There's, there's a reason why I'm doing this, right? Um, it isn't because I'm just, like, an adrenaline junkie or something, right? Even though there is a possibility that plays a small role, right? Um, it's impossible to tell exactly what. But a lot of it is that there is purpose over there, and it and like there is something to it, like the event, like there's always like an event happening, something to do. There's always work around. Like even if I just go to like the diner, there's a chance that like the sirens will just start blaring, and I'll make a note of it. And at the time, it's extremely annoying, but now it's strange that it's not there. Not saying that I want it, but there's something about the familiarity of hearing those things so often that's that's like strangely like I don't want to say alluring, but it's like something that like kind of. It's different. It, yeah, the banality of it is weird. It's weird that I can just like, like order a bunch of food on my phone, no matter where I'm in, where I'm at, basically in the United States, and it'll just be delivered to my home in 30 seconds, perfectly cooked. That's like that's that's weird to me. Yeah, I don't um, want to how... romanticize living in a conflict zone, but I I can't imagine that the the stark contrast between the convenience of living here and the austerity of living there, um, definitely helps you like better understand your priorities and what actually matters to you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, now I, I, I really feel a lot of passion for my work that I'm doing now, which was a problem because I didn't feel a lot of passion for my work for online for a little bit. Like I started feeling like I was getting disconnected from the real world, hosting these constant Internet debates about like, what's the best linguistic way to call somebody a retard without using the word retard because retard is ableist, right? Like this, like these conversations are interesting and everything, but like this isn't like real world shit, dog. Like you don't feel this shit in the real world. You go outside. This is intangible. The type of work I'm doing over there is so much more tangible has a, like an actual effect on people's lives and um seeing like all the aid that goes over there because of some of the people i interviewed i'm like super super hyped about that um but it, it is very banal and i do kind of just want to go back as soon as possible yeah I, I i fully get that i think it yeah i can't imagine what that would do to my psyche like the switch between those two environments either way you know it goes without saying that everyone over here is incredibly impressed with what you've been doing um thank you i appreciate that how do you feel? Okay, so yeah, um, how do you feel about what's going on over there at the moment, situation-wise? You know, I, I, I talked recently to Richard Hannay, a person who I'm sure you know, 
um yep. on the ongoing state of like the the you know military movements and how things are going there but as somebody who's been there personally like how do you feel things have turned um people are in generally high hopes like there 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 is general confidence in ukraine's ability to continue the struggle and like continue to win uh, the thing is, like, while I was over there, Ukraine had a ton of victories. I went to the Kharkiv Oblast right after the successful Kharkiv counteroffensive. I was actually there when we started to hear basically less artillery and everything else was just became missiles because they were no longer in range. And talking to people there, especially those who were there to push back the Kupyom's counteroffensive. I remember I was there, um, and I actually interviewed a soldier. Like, like, I can't really get too deep into who he was. I'm not allowed to share his who he was or what role he served we have to censor him yeah. from everything if we like include his stuff but he was like yeah like everybody in Kharkiv is fighting like when I was there we didn't see a lot of soldiers on the street because all of them was on the front line because the counter success the counter offensive was so successful that they were just like fuck we, we actually don't have enough soldiers to take advantage of the holes that we're making and that was like a, a really big W over there and I, and I really felt felt the spirit around that but i also was over there to like film like schools that were like blown up and like uh, playgrounds that were targeted and stuff like that so like even if there's like this feeling of like wow we got this and like oh my gosh we're pushing them back we're doing the impossible we're defeating the so-called second most powerful army on the planet like every bit of the way russia is making it as painful as possible and you can even see it from the strategy now the strategy right now for the winter is to freeze the ukrainians to death that is the strategy. Yeah. They admit it openly. And I'm telling people not to go listen to the Russian language outlets um, that translate to English by Russian media, and then they send them over. I'm saying go look at the Russian state media that they send to their domestic audience, not the stuff that they send for you to consume on Russia Today, English-speaking stuff that they give, they put in the mouth of whoever their spokesperson is going to be. Go listen to their own media. They talk openly about freezing the Ukrainians to death, making them pay for their hubris. If we displace another 10 to 15 million, then the Ukrainian problem will solve itself, and the Ukrainian problem will become a Polish problem. Like this, And this is openly said on Russian state media. And this is why the New Lines report published a report. The New Lines Institute published a report saying that this language, combined with many of their actions of almost like cultural annihilation in Ukraine, makes the art could make the argument for a potential genocide occurring. Um, so I would say that even though Ukraine is winning success after success, like those successes are drenched in the blood of innocent people and um, Ukrainian soldiers who died to have to uh, achieve it because Russia is going down swinging and like biting as hard as possible. The Kherson counteroffensive was a great example of this. During the Kherson withdrawal, and I was actually there for the start of the Kherson counteroffensive. I released a video recently called "I Got Shelled by the Russian Army." I hope people go check it out. It's got like a, it's got like eight, nine thousand views. If it got more attention, that'd be fantastic. Um, and in it, we were in Mykolaiv. We were there to film at a local hospital. Um, and talked to hospital staff about a hospital that got blown up by the Russians. It was the only, um, it was a really advanced, more modern medical, uh, like, trauma ward, which is where people would go if they got shot, and that's the exact place Russia blew up, and then continued to kill civilians that would need to go to that trauma ward. You can kind of see the pu- purpose of targeting the trauma ward, then, if if you're going to target the specific thing that is designed to deal with the injuries that you're creating in Mykolaiv. But um, after we talked to them, while on the top of the hospital, we see anti-air missiles probably fought on a, like about half a mile away from us. Like, like they make a cloud behind it and they start like hitting, hitting Ukrainian positions and anti-air fire starts like firing up. And I, it really took me aback because I didn't expect it to be that close. I was like, Oh, what's going on? What's going on? And I leave there. I head to a bar to like get some food, like a steak and some food in me. And while we're there, we find out that we're in the city of Mykolaiv during the launch of the Kherson counteroffensive. And the thing is, I, it was rumored for a while. I don't know if you remember this, Vosh, but they talked about it forever. Like, they'll hear song counteroffensive's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And some people started to think, like, well, is it ever coming? They've been saying this for so long. And so I didn't really believe it when all my contacts were texting me, like, Dylan, you're in Mikolaev. You are, like, with well within range of artillery, well within range of everything. You're on the, you're almost on the front line. Skedaddle. Like, be careful. Like, like, you need to make an aid delivery over there. I understand. We, we're making an aid delivery to, like, a dog like a dog shelter in the area um, that, that takes care of injured dogs and dogs that have been abandoned by their, um, uh, their family members and stuff. Uh, but actually um, got shelled before we got there. They missed it by like 300, 400 feet. Shrapnel hit the side of it. But well, um, we missed? were like, well, that's actually, I filmed up two dog shelters, both of which have been shelled. 
one in Kramators and one in Mikolaev. The other one in Kramators, which I shot at, the, the shell actually hit the dog center, and it destroyed many of the dog houses. It was pure luck that none of the dogs got killed. Jesus um, Christ. I haven't released a no video doubt on the deliberate dog yet. strategy on the part of the evil Ruskies um, to target the dogs and Ukrainian morale. Exactly. Um, but um, I, I, I wanted I, to finish... I want to I w- I w- I say really quickly, by the way, yeah. um, that obviously I'm very glad that you skedaddled, or at the very least... Um, you know, well, no, we didn't skedaddle. We did the exact opposite. Or at we the very least the weren't anyway. hit. Yeah. Um, and uh, genuinely insane that you, uh, you, you stayed there knowing full well there was a risk of that actually going forward. Well, I mean, like, I mean, like, the thing, the thing is, right, we did get shelled. Like, we got shelled in the city center, right? The shell fell about 150 feet away from me. Uh, if it was any closer, it would have killed me. Piece of shrapnel, like, very, very close. Um... The thing is, though, uh, like, other people did die in those strikes. Two died, 24 were injured. We got lucky. And the strikes were completely random in the city center. They were peppering the entire city center while they were there. We hear Russian jets, like, whoosh, coming overhead the whole time, sirens blaring, whole thing. But the first three shells didn't even have sirens because, like, they didn't know it was coming until it hit. And so, like, um, a lot of it is, like, just pure... A lot of it is, like, of course, safety precautions and knowing where to be and what to do in those situations. But those first three shells were just pure luck, right? Uh, complete luck. And the people who did die, they were they were civilians who just got unlucky, right? Yeah. And so, like, you know, there's only so much prep you could do. Um, but I, what, I, what I wanted... What I was telling the story for, and then I'll come back to that, like, question about, like, risking and, and like, you know, risking the life. But the reason I'm telling the story is... During the next two nights, when I was near the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, when I was filming over there, and we saw, like, explosions near it and stuff, I released a piece on that as well. Uh, That piece is called um, Living Near Ukraine's Next Chernobyl. And uh, and we filmed, and the night we slept near the city, we heard so much artillery bombardments. I heard 50 explosions in 30 seconds at one period. And that's when I knew, like, the Kherson counteroffensive was going to be, like, super, super serious. It's because, like... They were laying down heavy fucking firepower, and it ended up being extremely serious, and they retook the only provincial capital the Russians took the entire war in Kherson, and what they uncovered there was, I don't know if you heard the story, but they were actually orphanages that had to hide children away from the orphanages in the homes of the people who run these orphanages because the Russians were trying to steal the orphans and to bring deport them back, them to, back Russia. to Russia. Yeah, there was to, a whole... To stop them from getting a... To, like, de-Ukrainize them or whatever. That was the... Uh, that was what Brianna Joy Gray was talking about in one of the 78 recent times that she's been given a bunch of shit on social media, where she was like, um... What, what did she do? She, did she deny that was, like, ethnic cleansing, or did she say it was she, good? I she forget was, what exactly she said. Okay, so, at the time, she... Somebody brought it up to her in a debate... Uh, is like, see, isn't this something we should do work to stop? And she's like, no, because why isn't America doing like helping out everywhere? It was basic was the essence of her argument that afterwards she would like she put a like, question marks over it. Like the disputed claim that Russia is doing this when like we know that they're doing this. Like, I don't even. Yeah, this is this is why. And you said you weren't fulfilled hosting Twitch debate panels over how to say retard elegantly. And I feel like this is one of the things that's really made debate difficult for me as well lately is that in the past couple of years, all the subjects that I want to debate on are ones that there are there is no debate on. Like, you'll talk with Russia simps, and it'll be like, oh, Russia's not doing that, and then you'll take a look at official Russian state media saying, yes, we are doing that. Like you said about freezing them out. I have seen Russia defenders go like, no, no, they're doing this humanitarian, they're not trying to do indiscriminate strikes, and then you go on Russian state media, and they're like, yeah, fuck those Ukrainians, yeah, we're fucking, yeah, fucking them up, who cares? They're like, they're like reposting images of them executing their prisoners with fucking sledgehammers, and then, and then I don't know if you hear this, then one of the fucking people that did that execution, the organization Wagner, one of the representatives, sent a sledgehammer with their logo on it to EU members to eu representatives yeah no and, and and then and then you know no doubt all those people then went on social media and said no we didn't do that um it's really really frustrating in what feels like a i don't know like a post debate online discourse environment where it's quick it's kind of progressed to people like lying about the thing that they're doing at that moment visibly in front of you and it's it doesn't it's it's like there's no point you know um i mean you cover it as best as you can and, and god certainly you have um but I, I mean, it's weird because, like, I'll, I'll, I'll go there, 
Oh, sorry, continue. I didn't no, want I can mean just, to cut I can off just, Lush. I can understand uh, why, you know, this would provide you a lot more satisfaction than, than the aforementioned retard debating. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about the type of work I'm doing. And I do enjoy it, even though, of course, it's weird. To, it's weird to say that out loud, that I enjoy my work when my work is like, now it's becoming covering a war, but like I get fulfillment from it. I don't need to enjoy every aspect of it to like find some things in it that are joyful. Um, to be able to share these stories, I I do find a lot of I don't think personal that's fulfillment weird. in. Doctors can enjoy their work. I mean, it, you could be like, oh, you enjoy your work. The only reason a doctor has work is because people are sick and dying. Like nobody says that because everyone understands that what the doctor means is I enjoy being able to be on the good side of this bad thing, and that's what you're doing. Yeah, that's true. But you were you were asking about like risking like the lives and like the risking your life and stuff like that. Um, I guess for me, like something that I, I've done, and this has really helped me, is the first thing I've done is accepted the fact that if I die, I most likely won't know that I died. Right? Because let's say these things about these like the time when I'm most present and most thinking about my death was not actually when I was directly being shelled by the Russian army. It was when I got into the, the vans afterward to like get away from the shelling. And the reason why is I don't know if you watch all these like videos online, but the majority of videos where you see people dying from this war, it's people blowing up in cars and armored vehicles and tanks and vans and transport. And the reason why is like these vans that were like transporting around it. I had the experience on the Zaporozhye front line and I had this experience on uh, in, in Mikolaev. They're basically just moving coffins. They have no protection. They've got no steel plating. If they get hit, you're dead. Like you're, you're just, and he's not even gonna know you're dead. And if you do survive, you're gonna be so disfigured, then you're, then you're just fucked. So I'm just, you know, just hope to be dead. But the thing is about being in these cars versus being outside of them is when you're outside of them, you have better control of like your vision and your hearing, and like you can personally move and have an impact. And so you're very much thinking of like, what can I do right now to keep myself safe or to do something to help others? If you watch the footage of me being shelled you see me like debating like should we get we need to get closer over there to like get filming we need to go where they just hit and then it was then saying immediately oh, fuck but they might double tap and then we'll get struck but when you're in these vans and you're in these cars moving around you, there's not much you can do to like improve your odds so you're left there with your thoughts and so you start thinking about like i'm i'm in a fucking moving coffin right and so what, something that i've done in those situations uh, which that was a big thing in Zaporozhye because it was the first time I was near the front line and I was surrounded by soldiers. Uh, I had full gear on. I didn't have full, full gear on Mikolaev. And what I do is I think of the statistical probability. Like, well, odds are that the most likely not going to hit me because there's been a million people who have done, who've been through this direct street and only so many have died. So the odds are I'll probably live. That has helped me some. Uh, of course, thinking if I do die, probably won't even know, help me some. And the last thing, and this is like the more, like the bigger thing is, um, uh, this is gonna, this is the most like soy Reddit thing I'm ever gonna do. You watch Cowboy Bebop, yeah? Actually, no. God, you, what? Nah, it's been on my list for a while. I tried watching it twice and I dropped it both times and I don't know why, because I liked it both times. I think it's because I tried watching it during a flight. Um... Matt, it's, it's on the list. I probably know what you're going to be referring to anyway. It's too much cultural osmosis. There, there's a scene near the end of it where Spike, uh, the main... Fuck, I can't believe you haven't won. Ah, I don't I know, know if I, I know who this. Spike I is. I, I saw that much. Yeah. This is, this... I saw at least well, two minutes into the first episode. So there's a scene near the end where Spike is talking to the girl, Faye, or whatever her name is. And when she, and when he's talking to her, she, he's about to go into some some thing that's like really dangerous. And she's like, "What are you gonna do? Just throw away your life?" And he says something along the lines in like the spirit of it. And this really connected with me. And it's weird to say like an anime connected with me in this way, but it, it was along the lines of like, "If I do not live this way, then I don't. Then am I truly living? If I don't live personally in a way that I think is the like complete like." Like, like, is the end result or, like, the natural end goal or the natural end point of, like, what I think my political activism is, even if it endangers my life, then, like, am I truly living my values? Am I truly living who I am if I'm not willing to do that? And if I would rather be living my life not only in a way I personally enjoy and find the most fulfillment in, but is most, I think, in line with what I believe ideologically, and I'm very, very, very supportive of Ukrainian democracy. So I almost feel like it's, like, I have to, in a way, to live my life the way I have to live it. To like, to not only to live it most truly free in fear and living free of 
letting fear control me. I let fear impact me, but I don't let it control me and to allow me to like have the most impact politically that I need to have. And so for me, I feel like risking my life is part of living my life. Uh, if you don't put all the caps, if you don't put all the uh, chips on the table, then like you haven't really gambled is what I'm saying. Yeah, well, that philosophy works great for you. I'm going to stay on the computer, actually, if it's all the same. Um, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad it works for you, though. It'd be a pretty um, be pretty difficult to get any kind of live coverage of uh, on the ground, uh, uh, you know, military action if it weren't for people with a uh, daring attitude towards uh, 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 covering that sort of thing. Seriously, though, um, it is, uh, Appreciate you know, it. if no, if there's if there's any like real message here or any like resounding lesson that can be taken, it's that um, deep within the heart of every man um, and non man, I guess, too, if you really want to be particular, is the possibility of desoyifying yourself. Right. Um, you can True. go from being the Twitch streamer to the live uh, war coverage reporter. Um, you, you can be that guy. Um, but I'm still arguing with chaos as Mel, so nothing's really changed. Well, but that's it, right? Like it's it's yin, it's it's yin and yang, right? Um, you're you're like the envoy for the rest. You're the inspiration. You're the torch held forward. Um, oh my god! I'm I mean, start it genuinely is, It's gonna be great. It is pretty crazy, though, right? I mean, you have to. I'm sure you get an earful of this from your friends and family. You know, people who know you better than I do. How insane what you're doing actually is. Um, so you don't need it repeated here, but it's still just absolutely wild. You know, we talked to, to Anna recently, um, whose full name I'm not going to attempt here so as to avoid embarrassing... Anastasia. Anastasia, thank you. To avoid embarrassing myself. And obviously she's doing some incredibly brave work herself, but there is kind of like this um, this justifying mechanism there, right? Where it's like, okay, well, she lives there. You don't live there. Um, nope. No, which, you know, it, 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 it definitely gives you more of an excuse to skedaddle um, if ever you wanted to take that. Well, but you want to go back It's in. weird. It's, yeah, I do. Oh, I'm going back in. I, if I don't go back in, I don't know if I, what I'm even doing. Um, uh, I almost feel like I have to. It's very, it's very strange. I feel like I got to be involved until we win the war. In a way. I feel like I have to. Then I'll go back to college. Then I'll continue doing politics, maybe. Or maybe I'll just move on to another war because this is also I I'm, I'm like each video I release on this is getting very better. Like the first one was just raw footage because I was like I had the philosophy originally going into this of just complete gonzo, no commentary. If you put commentary over it, you're biasing. You just need to show them the complete like unfiltered view. But I'm slowly like getting like oh no, you can like add commentary and you can like add you can like guide people along. Just and the every getting... every racial epithet directed against Russian people just overlaid on top of the war footage. You know pure prop propaganda um just absolutely just, yeah crank that shit out no pretense towards an unbiased coverage the biden banderite coalition is is expanding but um absolutely but the but yeah like i'm 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 more more happy with the work i'm putting out like i got shelled by the russian army is much closer to what i want to be putting out in the future so like i i think i'm i don't know what i'm really gonna do after this but i gotta stay with this till the end of the war and I think part of the thing you brought up, like, she didn't, like, choose this at all. I did choose this, which also means that, like, I talk a little bit, like, I, I try to talk less about, like, my personal struggles with the war or, like, my mental health issues with the war, which, of course, like, I have those as well, because, like, I chose to be there, right? Like, I could leave at any time. These people can't leave. And so that's why I always try to emphasize when we talk about that, uh, talk about this, is, like, I chose to be there. A lot of people didn't. Um, and so I, I think for them, like they, they, ch I, I chose this, they didn't. And that's an, uh, that's a choice I got to make that they didn't. And I think that is something that, that you do need to emphasize when we talk about war journalism versus like the people who, you know, live there. Like yeah, for me, this is their village that exploded. It's their village that exploded, not mine. Yeah. I don't think it's disrespectful to emphasize that though. You know, I mean, the, the, everyone watching you can know that you could leave if you wanted to. The question isn't whether or not you're as trapped there as any of the villagers whose villages are getting blown up. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess there's like that implicit, you know, oh, are you suggesting you have it as bad? But I think it's, um, you know, speaking as someone who has no intentions of going anywhere near the front line, I do think it's fully interesting to hear that side of things from your perspective. I appreciate it. I appreciate it a lot. I so mean, is there any... Uh... Uh, well, sorry, you had something? Oh, no, just, you know, there aren't that many of those perspectives, right? Not delivered towards an English-speaking audience. Obviously, plenty of Ukrainians speak English, but 
um, if somebody wants to get like info on what's going on in Ukraine as an English speaker, people are normally limited to like a collection of psychotic like national security, um, you know, like fan accounts and That's some true. journalists who are reporting from afar. In terms of people on the ground, there cannot be that many active English speakers presenting their content in English um, in Ukraine. At least well, I haven't seen that many. I guess, like, <clears throat> well, for me, I think the first thing that needs to be established is that the English-speaking world is extremely important to Ukraine. Because the UK, uh, America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, these are all countries that support Ukraine, and America, especially in the UK as well, their support is extremely important to Ukraine. So I think it's really important to inform English speakers, because if English speakers don't aren't informed, then they might be less willing to continue to support aid to Ukraine, which Americans are still overwhelmingly support sending aid to Ukraine, because most Americans, I would like to think, when they're not being lied to about weapons of mass destruction, uh, are, are generally moral individuals, I would like to say. I know that's a wild, a wild thing to say, but I think overall Americans are generally okay. Um, it's loud minorities that dominate us. So I, I think it's important to do this, this journalism. But the, the thing is, I think I met a lot of reporters while I was over there, but I mean, they weren't everywhere and there's a million stories to tell. And the thing is, and this is the way I always tell people, um, for every war crime you see, there's like 10 that you don't see. Right. Yeah. So like, yeah. If, if you think about the scale of like the Holocaust, there will be so many war crimes that occurred during the Holocaust and the Second World War. They will never be documented either a because all the witnesses were killed, b all the uh, all the evidence destroyed, or c the person who had testimony died before they could say it. Not to and, not to mention with the yeah. Holocaust, a lot of what we got was a deliberate effort from FDR and a bunch of others to go over and document everything. They didn't just incidentally get it while pushing back the German front lines. They, were, they basically sent over, like, an investigative battalion um, alongside the capture of tens of thousands of officers to get everything they had. And they still missed a lot. Um, so, yeah, no, just, just what we have now, which is just at the ebb and flow of the, the front lines being pushed back and forth, is, is a minuscule fraction of what there actually is. Absolutely. I mean, from my personal conversations with people, the stories I'm told by people who are like at Bucha about like, yeah, there was a friend of mine. Um, I remember we were at Bucha and I recorded the, the videos publicly available. Um, it's I think it's titled um, Exploring the Ruins of Bucha. Um, I, I talked to this old Ukrainian like Babushka uh, religious woman who walked out of the church when we went to visit the mass grave in Bucha uh, and filmed there. And she tells us about, and the thing is, we can't go certify this stuff. We can't go because a lot of this is like the evidence just isn't there. Or there, there's so many people that need to be investigated for war crimes. There's so many things to investigate. You just can't investigate it all. That's why I think it's important for somebody, f for freelance journalism and, and war journalism and for people to like go out and, and, you know, record this stuff. But like she tells us like stories about people like being shot in the back of the head just for speaking Ukrainian in the presence of Russian soldiers or people who are or choir boys who were tortured in the basements of buildings trying to get information out of them about Ukrainian troop positions or, hey, you're really a child spy, you know, the type of stuff you're told that I don't have the evidence for, but the testimony I hear and it's like some of that might be not true, but a lot of it is true. We just don't have the evidence for it. And now all we have is a testimony. That's why when I go back, I'm going to try. And I did a few this time or the first time, you know, I, I'm getting my hands on this stuff. I'm trying to get used to it. I'm, I'm going to try to do a lot more sit down interviews with people. And I'm going to be releasing those as they try to talk about the testimony, what they experienced, because a lot of that stuff, like there's never going to be any physical evidence for it. And all that exists is the testimony. It also sells the best to a Western audience you know, sell, like, in terms of, of presentation and interest. Um, war footage has a pretty limited audience on account of it being pretty, you know, grim by default. Um, yeah. uh, whereas, you know, that the human element tends to make people feel a lot more connected. I remember there was that video from, um, um, who, wait, who put out that video where they, um, we went over it on stream. They went over a couple of interviews with Ukrainians. It was like a larger channel. They went in there and they met them in person. Channel 5. Ah. Channel 5, that's right. Channel, Channel 5. 5, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you know, he did it early on in Lviv. Um, yeah. Yeah. Notably, very far from the front lines, unlike you, brave boy. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the... Um, either, Not either only way. if I can get Channel 5 viewership for doing stuff 10 times more expensive and 10 times more dangerous. Yeah, you just... But, need, I, don't got, but I don't got the Andrew Callahan charm, buddy. You, you I don't got it. You need an incredibly fucked up looking guy with an afro um, following you around. 
And that, that friend of his, the one who wears the ski mask, you just, you need a crew running true. around. True, I need a crew. like a, shit. I do. I have some weird Polish friends of mine, like some weird Poles I can bring around with me. Who doesn't like the Polish? Uh, nobody. Nobody's ever disliked a Pole. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you certainly deserve Channel 5 numbers. Oh, I appreciate it. One day. One day. Um, so... Um, is there any other questions you want to talk about, or should I just like? Do you want to like, like uh, stories or any questions that you have else? Like, I have... no. Well, I have. The, well, the problem is like asking questions make me feel like I'm a fucking um, info tourist or whatever. You know, like like uh, like your relatives come back from abroad. You know, what you do? Did you do this? You do that? Um, which you can ask ask me. Hey, 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 hey. The better the questions, the better the thumbnail, buddy. Yeah. Fuck. Well, I'm bad at that because I don't normally. Um, you're gonna you're gonna ask me like, do you fuck anyone in a war zone? You're gonna fucking I don't care. I'm not gonna ask you any personal questions like that. Um, no, I mean I guess okay. Well, here here's one uh, closest you've gotten to um, to your knowledge to Russian troops. Have you ever gotten within eyesight in any of them, or or or, or heard uh, uh, heard any of them, or or like uh, you knew they were within a mile or two? Like how close? Have uh, they you they've one mile. When I was in the, the first video I released on the ground is an unironically like, if you know what's going on in that video, there are like a million red fucking flags in that video where like, we're just standing within like five to 10 feet of an unexploded Russian musician, just filming it like our foot, like five ways, like five feet from it. Like we, you hear shelling in the background constantly. We get followed by a Russian drone and we run into the forest to run away from it. Artillery starts to crawl in our direction. We get in the van, run away. The van breaks down as the drone is like circling overhead. Runs away. There's like a million red flags in it. But we did end up after all of that day actually getting one mile from the Russians on the front and they showed us all the positions. They showed us the dugouts. They showed us where where the Russian position is. We could see the Russian tree line. We could see where the Russians like were like if they point that way, we know they're at that tree line. We didn't see individual bodies, but we saw where they were and we knew they knew where we were and we knew that they had tried to like maybe kill us with a drone earlier that day. Yeah, and they did shell the position when we we're going to it. So they, yeah, they, like we we got we got we got lucky that day. One mile is definitely within earshot and eyesight. Jesus, <sighs> when you get back there, or when when you intend on heading back over there, um, do you know what what's what city are you hitting up first? I assume that like you don't want to travel too much between different areas, um, because the time spent on the road traveling is time you're not like actively digging Dreamy. into something at it. Because the more time you spend, like, traveling between cities, I imagine that cuts into the time you spend, like, with war footage or interviewing people or whatever, right? I know Ukra Ukraine's a pretty big country, right? Like, you could, you could lose a day traveling between two cities easily. Oh, yeah. Well, the thing is, for me, is I need to stream while also covering a war to pay my bills, right? Mm -hmm. So the dynamic I have is insane, where, like, I'll go... Like we'll deal, we'll like do a day, and if I get back to the city in time, I'll start up a stream and be like, "Hey, everybody, I just got back. Yeah, we got shelled a few times. Anyway, and then I just do the day stream, right? Like that is that that is something I'm doing that is probably not like the most effective for like rest and recover. But I also need to pay my bills at the end of the day, and I am a streamer. That's how I make my money. And if anybody wants to help me pay my bills and make that a lot easier, you can go to Dylan Burns, uh, Dylan Burns TV on Patreon and support me there, of course. But of course. It, it's it's really weird because the streaming and being a streamer and a and 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 a war zone is very strange. Definitely, when you have to get closer to violence, you basically just have to like skip a week streaming to do a lot of this stuff, which is difficult when you're trying to pay the bills. Yeah, especially if you're streaming on Twitch because uh, they have yep. such yeah. Do you have I can't stream a lot of the war stuff. Like I feel like stream? I can stream a lot more of it. I I have a I have a second channel called Dylan Burns Live, D Y L A M B U R N S L I V E, where I do two daily uploads and I that's also where I probably stream if I streamed on YouTube. And of course the main channel, which I'm trying to make my more like artsy, like here's all my Ukraine content and war footage channel. That second channel is where I'd probably stream. It's also where you can get my live stream content, but like no, nah, I, I don't really stream on YouTube much because dude, it's scary, man. <laughs> You mean in terms of like accidentally tripping some content flag shit? I, I, it's not, it's maybe that, but I think I'm more scared of just like the jump from Twitch to YouTube. Like, I, I don't, I don't know if I could do it successfully. 
Maybe. Um, Wait, didn't didn't Twitch recently take a uh, uh, Twitch exclusivity out of their contract for partners? That is true, but I, I guess I, I can I can do some streams on YouTube. I just can't make the big jump. I can't do uh, what you've done and whatever the people have done. I don't think at this point. But I would have I, stayed I, on both platforms if I could have. Now, of course, I'm I'm more cemented. But you know, YouTube is definitely a lot more. Um, a lot more permissive when it comes to that kind of thing which you know definitely is, the stuff i'm doing i just yeah it's it's a it, first i have the website now dylanburns.tv mm -hmm. so i think that's like the first step for me ever making this transition if one day i get banned on twitch and i know people uh are mass reporting me i know russian uh hackers have tried to like get into my accounts and shit mm -hmm. um uh, especially discord and like discord will tell me this shit too like, like yeah someone tried to hack into your account from russia i was like oh okay um like I'm, I'm worried that it's like a ticking time bomb before like I show a war clip on Twitch and somebody gets me banned. That that does scare me, uh, because at that point it's just like if I'm in a war zone and I just lost my job, like th there's like a there's a certain amount of like instability I'm willing to deal with. Getting shot out's one thing, but getting shot out and being unemployed is another. <laughs> because now it's like, damn, what am I even getting shot out for? You know? Yeah, it's you. You need you need that as um as a a, a, a legitimizing force if nothing else, um. Well, if if anything, you know, I I imagine it's it's not a sure shot, but I I do hope that Twitch would give you some leeway on this, given the moral righteousness of what you're doing. I know that they're not, you know, um, you know, the, the corporations don't tend to make decisions based on stuff like that. But I think optically it would be quite bad for them if it was like, yeah, we had like a streamer who was doing on the ground like live reporting in defense of Ukraine, the country that America is aligned with in terms of its military support. Oh yeah, but you know they got attacked, so we banned them. You know, like oh, well, that'd be like somebody gets swatted like, yeah. and they get shot while getting swatted, and then Twitch is like, damn, that sucks. No violence banned. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> which which I think they tend to be a bit more lenient in cases like that but i don't know they're so inconsistent honestly youtube has been worse for it i've gotten more in trouble with youtube for this type of stuff than twitch i my second channel actually my i had i did a video on the kanye alex jones stuff because again that's like that's just content gold i mean it's terrible it's awful but from a from the perspective of a streamer oh my god you know you get what i'm saying right yeah absolutely. like holy shit fucking one of the most popular rap stars in the world dresses up like fucking king cobra goes on the fucking alex jones podcast and just says what holocaust i don't know what you're talking about as alex jones starts getting intimidated by him slowly ever so slowly uh it's it was it was like it was like a south park skit and so i covered the whole thing i uploaded my second channel and it got a, it got taken down after a day i was uh, and, and I know people like the thing is, is, you know, you get mass reported. I know I get mass reported. Destiny know he gets mass reported. Every major creator knows they get mass reported. The more you talk about it, the more attention is going to drag to it. And the more people are going to mass report you. You can't really do anything about it. Yeah, there's not. You, YouTube is just too big. There's not really any the, 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 unless a person has like a real content manager who can do behind the scenes work when it comes to strike management. There's very little you can actually do there, unfortunately. Yeah, it just fucking sucks because like before when I was with Hippy Dippy, like I was fucking like it was fucking good days, man. It was good times. But now like it's it's just like if I lose one like big video and it was four and a half hours, I watched like everything, right? Um, like that's like actually losing like a paycheck. It's like oh that fucking sucks. Uh, and so I, I don't know, man. YouTube and Twit, I I don't like the trend of all these big uh tech companies basically cutting staff. For less content moderation, just betting it all on AI, man. I think the real, the real, the real path needs to be hiring more staff for these companies. Yeah, I, I mean, it's really difficult to judge from not behind the scenes because I'm sure that back there there are a ton of complexities that I couldn't even begin to fathom. But it does, it does seem like there are some like obviously unworkable problems um, that that they're just not committing enough to. You know, I don't know how much of it is like them wanting to cost save or how much they lose on server costs relative to wages paid but um obviously if things get unstable enough for larger creators it causes a fuss for the platform so it, it, there's kind of like an internal pressure pushing that out but you and i aren't large enough to like take that kind of notice which sucks oh well yeah true i mean ho like hopefully you know god willing uh it's just um the system is you know, ever more unfair if you're not large enough for a stir from you to actually be, like, recognized site-wide. If Markiplier gets a video strike, you know, then we'll... Markiplier should come to Ukraine with me.
True. That would be incredible content. Dude, I have offered to so many people the Ukraine, like, hey, look, come here. We, I can have you interview locals. It'll be like, da, da, da. and so many people have shown interest. Nobody ever ends up doing it ever. Yeah, you know why? Have you considered? Mm, it's, it's a little scary, actually. Um, ah. You know, you've committed to it. Uh, I will not. Uh, I'll not blame other people for uh, for having not thrown their weight behind the uh, the wartime vacation zone. Hey, look, okay, I, there's a lot of things scarier than going to a war zone, okay? Watching your debate with Michael Tracy, uh, talking to Chaos as Mel. Do you see that? Transition from Twitch to YouTube. I did, and I talked to Michael Tracy. Oh, yeah, wait, no, I popped in on that. I debated I think, I, I think I hosted you at the very tail end of that, or at least I was going to. No, I think Maybe. I, I got him to commit to not wanting to send aid to Ukraine, because before he wouldn't say whether he even supported it or not. Yeah, the I best did very well, but I, I was very, very patient. The best case scenario is that after two hours, you might get him to state one prescriptive position. Um, and, that, and that is literally the most you can hope for when talking to him, outside of just making fun of him, which is what I settled on about 15 minutes in, because like, Jesus Christ, you know, whatever. I know what he believes. He knows what he believes. Everyone watching knows what he believes. You know, past the point, it's, it's, it's just really boring trying to like tease it out of him. Absolutely, absolutely. The thing, the thing is about the conversation that was, um, it was he talks a lot. Um, <laughs> he talks a lot, and it's it's not only does he have the gift of gab, but it's also like I think a lot of times he just kind of like rambles off. And I'm not saying that he was never saying anything of substance. It's I'll just like he get he'll just get. <laughs> <laughs> no, he does. Get... No, no, no. He does that on purpose. One hundred percent, he does. He will get actively offended if you ask him to just answer a question. Well, it's a very deliberate strategy on his part. I think that well, he's a neo-Nazi personally. Um, man's okay. taking a strong. Wait, a neo-Nazi, really? Or maybe like a regular Nazi. Maybe it's not that neo. Yeah, he spent a lot of time engaging in like weird roundabout defenses of russia that i haven't seen since browsing like crypto nazi forums and shit you know the whole like actually america started the war with nazi germany and actually you know our involvement ended up worsening things these are like very like far left field esoteric conspiracies that i've only ever seen promoted by nazis i think it's just like you you know that if you want to defend putin comparisons to hitler will come up and if you if you see the writing on the wall there, you might as well just go about defending Hitler as well, and you'll do it the same way you defend Putin, right? Not by saying he's good, but rather by like throwing eighty million caltrops onto the debate field when it comes to discussing literally any empirical like bad thing that they've done, which is what Nazis do with Hitler, right? Like they don't they don't say, oh yeah, the Holocaust was good. Instead, they say, ah well, mm -hmm, wooden doors. Uh, hey, look at this photo. Isn't this weird? Like that kind of stuff, you know? It's caltrops. Um, so yeah, I've I've seen that a lot, usually from people in that disposition. He might also just believe nothing and and he just leans into the Nazi conspiracism well, because it I, it's aligning with his values. I'm not sure. I guess I guess I got two things for that. I think the first thing is in my conversation with him, it wasn't that he never said anything of substance, is that he would make a critique or he would say something that's true. He would say something that's like that might be a like an interesting fact in isolation, but then I was like, okay, okay, what do we take from that, right? What do we espouse from that position, right? What do we take from what you just said? What do you mean by that? What are you indicating? Do you indicating that we, therefore we shouldn't send aid? Or are you indicating this? Because my response to this is this. And he would be like, no, that's just like a fact, you know, maybe we should make note of, and then we move on. So there's like, he's just saying things with no like prescriptive, like yeah, exactly. explanation well, of the exactly world. Yeah, that's exactly what they like to do, and, right? It's like, and, oh, I'm not denying the Holocaust. I'm just saying, don't you think it's weird well, if you look at it? But that's that's the second thing. I don't think he's a neo-Nazi or a Nazi in any way, Vosh. I think the best way to describe Michael Tracy would be, I think he's kind of a contrarian. I think basically like if he sees a kind of like a mainstream position, I think he ultimately is like, I don't trust this mainstream media nonsense. I'm going to go look at all the facts. And then that, kind of, that type of like my mindset uh, sometimes leads to people take being just contrarians in every issue is because mainstream media says this so i gotta say the other thing right i feel like he falls into contrarian rabbit hole quite a lot um and 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 like once he's in it it's kind of hard to get out you just start digging like a deeper and deeper hole and i think that's what happened with like the the back and forth he had about like the start of the second world war and the holocaust i think that's a much easier explanation than finding out he's like a secret neo-nazi i don't i don't know if it's that secret i don't want to i don't want to tussle with you about it but well, I find often yeah, these prove to me. Give me the documents, Vosh. Sure, fine. Prove them that it was Joseph Mengele and he collaborated. If contrarianism consistently leads people down the exact same ideological line over and over and over again, it's not actually contrarianism. They're just only comfortable phrasing their positions in a way that challenges the mainstream narrative without committing to a prescriptive defense of the narrative they actually have. It's the same as like 
the contrarians with like COVID denialism because a real contrarian wouldn't just go and immediately adopt every single hegemonic conservative talking point as a framework of skepticism against the CDC's talking points. They would be broadly contrarian. In reality, all the people who said they were contrarian about vaccines were actually just anti-vax. You know, there wasn't, there was, a, there were actually very few people who were contrarian, uh, who were uh, like rejecting the conservative mantra on the subject, but also distrustful of the CDC. In reality, these people were all just like towing the conservative line. So I, I tend not to believe that like contrarian line too much. I don't know how many people are motivated by true crime. Well, I think as opposed to just like being too dishonest to actually adopt the position they believe in. I think it would be much easier though if like even let's say we didn't call him a contrarian we say he's anti something I think it would be like anti America or anti globalism or anti establishment or anti the Nazis the international were anti order. globalism. Well yeah the the Nazis were but so are a lot of non Nazis there's a lot of weird populist types that aren't Nazis even though they're like hardcore populists right like Huey Long was somebody who was very anti uh anti establishment very very populist he was somebody who was also extremely fucking corrupt, but but he also was not a Nazi. He actually had quite displeasure for the Nazis and their belief systems. So I do think it is possible that Michael Tracy is not a secret card-carrying clan member, neo-Nazi, Hitler, oh, 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 Joseph Mengele supporter. I'm not saying secret card-carrying, blah, blah, blah. I'm not just saying he lies about his positions, which you know he does. You've seen him lie all the time. Doesn't well, have, I think it's it's, he conspiracy. never lies. He just never answers. No, he, no, he, he lies. He misrepresents what he said in tweets before. He'll he'll object. He'll like empirically lie about stuff, right? When I talked with him, it wasn't just him taking forever to get to answers. Um, he would ask a question or make a position. I would counter it, provide empirical evidence to that counter, and then like two minutes later, he would respond in a way that ignored what I said and continued with the line. I don't believe I my the whole like don't attribute to to malice what could be equally attributed to incompetence or whatever I, I i believe that less and less these days when it comes to conservatives it's or at least their incompetence just seems to really reliably lead them down the exact same line of propaganda you know what i mean yeah also he um i did i did pressure him on if you bullied him Vosh. i pressured him and if you were uh, if i bullied him, him? If you were if you were a bully when you said his oh, name so much. Oh, well, I was trying to. I hope he I hope he felt that way. <laughs> he did not. He said you weren't a cyber bully, but he said he you acted I said you acted with to him I told him you acted with disdain in his direction. Disdain. Yeah, I I hate him. Um I hate I hate cowardice. So um uh it, it it's 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 inimical to to, to debate, you know. They can't actually say <laughs> anything. Um and it takes time and I will one day die and at some point I'm going to be counting my hours and Oh, I spent two hours of my finite life trying to get Michael Tracy to commit to a position he's expressed 87 times on Twitter, you know? Whew. Um, just, uh, uh, just a crime against me personally. Yo, do you, don't you think it's interesting, the, uh, the Kanye West stuff when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war? It's so weird that all of the international far right and neo-Nazi organizations that we know of, or and now the richest neo-Nazi on the planet, Kanye West, seem to support Russia, even though Russia supposedly is participating in a denazification operation. Vosh, I, I say this because I'm starting to think that possibly, quite, quite possibly, Russia could be hypocritical on this issue. This is what I mean about the, like, the worthlessness of debate on these subjects, you know? Because um, this entire time I've argued with the lefties, right? Or so-called lefties, you know? At the uh, you know critical support decolonization russia's defending itself blah blah and meanwhile all of the nazis in america are like yeah we're fully pro-ukraine all the nazis are the entire far right is completely behind russia um or sorry yeah they're all behind russia um like all of yeah them. you slipped for a second your your ukraine Zelensky uh programming chip sorry the yeah, banderites slipped out for a second yeah the banderites yeah. pulled me down the banderite radio waves you know how they have coa has the radio the cia has a radio wave gun the ukrainians have a banderite outside your window with the banderite gun the and, only and it nazis, ran out of batteries the only nazis that defend ukraine are the ukrainian nazis and they do it out of nationalism not out of line of their like ideological biases outside of that you know um, in terms of like what Nazis want, Russia represents all of their positions far better than Ukraine. Ukraine being a liberal democracy led by a Jew, and Russia being a far right autocracy led by the guy who funds other far right hey, autocracies. Look, I am positive that the leader of a neo Nazi state would institute non discrimination protections for trans people. That's actually the first thing Hitler did when he got into office. He instituted non discrimination protections for trans people. 
That was the first yeah, well, step. Hitler was famously a chaser, of course. So he had to protect. Yes, he was famous. He was he was real. He was he was he was scrolling every femboy subreddit, and he was really problematic about the word trap too. It was, it was, oh, what? Well, yeah. Was, you know, Hitler was kind of problematic. When the anime meme sub uh, had that schism over the word trap, you know, Hitler came down hard on that. He was he was posting through the whole thing on Twitter. Oh yeah, he was mega posting, mega posting. I think he just got unbanned too. <laughs> yeah, they um they were they're going from um most transphobic to least transphobic in terms of the unbans Kanye first then Hitler um then destiny then destiny yes naturally. then destiny um naturally. but just narrow um, just narrowly t- neck and neck with Hitler uh yeah no the whole the it's literally like the far right in every country on earth supports Russia there's just no reason for them not to considering Russia's so much closer to Nazi I mean, values than Ukraine is but Alexander Dugan, um, a lot of people overplay how much influence he has, right? I'm going to be for real. But there is one thing about Alexander Dugan where he had influence, not only in some of the realm of foreign policy, but he wrote a book called The Foundations of Geopolitics. I don't know if you've read it or you know anything about it. I've actually read a couple of excerpts from it. It's pretty fucking insane. Uh, In this book, uh, it advocates for a lot of things, like splitting up China and annexing large swaths of it, and Kazakhstan and Finland and Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania... Ukraine, like uh, annexing tons of territory, but also in it, it advocates a policy of hyping up the American far right, making it like really, really like funding like racist shit under the idea that eventually you, like racial issues in the United States as a way of so terrible. Internal, yeah, internal yeah, uh, it, discord disorder, uh, which then they could take advantage of through America becoming less powerful because of its internal problems like that is taught in Russian military academies. That's part of the required re- reading to become like for Russian officers. Now, I'm not saying that that is necessarily the exact strategy that Russia is using, but it like to be honest, like they have funded the Internet Research Agency with spreaded most far right and far left misinformation. They would hype up uh, like groups on Facebook and stuff that were like pushing BLM stuff as well as like far right Nazi stuff. Not to equate the two, but to say that they were trying to hype up both sides for a confrontation. Because they want that. They want disorder in the United States. And so there is a benefit that, that Putin's government and the Russians see from having the far right take over. Not only because they agree ideologically, but also that that shift would cause chaos, and that chaos could be taken advantage of. Yeah, no, and, and it sounds, you know, it's working. It's, it, it works. Um, it's, um, yeah, well, I guess more ammunition to the point that the only way liberal democracy globally can survive, and anything better than liberal democracy, if we ever get to that point, um, will be through the, uh, the the complete destruction of the Kremlin as a political institution. Um, you know, people, when people talk about Dugan's influence, you know, it, it's not like a day to day thing, right? But that book has been like the template for Russian action the past couple of decades, at least for Putin's uh, administration. And um, yeah, again, it's it's the, it comes down to the debate thing. This this keeps this bothers me, you know, when I keep coming back to it because I like to remember when I started the channel just three and a half years ago, you know. A lot of the debates that I had back then were with people who, while retarded, um, had actual positions that they would defend, you know? Conservatives that I would debate would have positions on economics. I would argue with them over whether or not Trump's tax cuts would have good or bad effects on the working class, about whether or not jobs could be brought back. Now, there are no prominent conservatives who will debate anymore, and there are no positions they would be willing to debate, even if I could have them on, because... There's nothing left to these positions, right? The, all conservative positions held require an like a deliberate willingness to ignore reality. Um, oh, oh yeah, Russia is actually anti-colonial and Ukraine is Nazis. Well, only if you're willing to ignore everything. Um, it's very, very frustrating, you know? Like, what, what more is to be said, right? It's, it's blatant anti-imperialism. Also, the only reason... Russia not only engaged in colonialism, but usually when people bring this up, they talk about Africa. That's only because they failed in doing colonialism in Africa. That isn't because they didn't want to. Uh, they actually tried to do something in Djibouti. They just failed. And they've done colonialism in many, many, many other places. But when it comes to that book that you're talking about, it's hard to say if the Russian government has used it as a basis for their actions. Because the, the things that they list in that book, the government has absolutely done some of those things. But the problem is, uh, those things would also probably, that Putin has done, would probably be the general same path any hardcore far-right Russian nationalists would take. 
uh, in Putin's shoes. So it's hard to say if they're just doing what we would, what any far right nationalist would do, or if they're following the tenets of the book. It's kind of hard to say. But the same spirit of the book, like you know, it's still there. Um, is there anything else you wanted to ask me? Anything else you wanted to you wanted to hit on, Mister Mister V Man? Yeah, I defer to you. What do you want to share? What do I want to show, share? I don't know. You know, I have so many stories. Um, oh, you know what? I could talk about a, a video that I've almost finished the script for. It. I have all the footage for it. I can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. So I was sitting in a bar in Lviv uh, probably, I don't know, maybe four months ago. And I was talking with my friend Patrick Hillsman, who's a reporter who, you know, covered the civil war in Syria. Uh, well, he was there with me and two aid workers who I cannot disclose who they were. Uh, and we were there to discuss uh, a delivery of an aid shipment, but this wasn't like, you know, bandages or anything. This actually was Elon Musk's Starlink, you know, the new chief twit of Twitter. Right. And we were discussing how it needed to be delivered to the front line area around the Donbass to Ukrainian forces in the area. And after some talk and, you know, uh, me helping pay with the gas and stuff, uh, they, uh, the aid workers actually agreed to take the camera and film their delivery process of Elon Musk's Starlink. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm working on a big piece where I talk about the benefits of Starlink and the downsides of Starlink, because there are a lot of benefits of Starlink. I understand that a lot of people kind of see Starlink as like another pet project of like the rich kind of uh, full of himself billionaire, richest man in the world, Elon Musk. But Starlink does use low orbit satellites, which supposedly, as long as the congestion is not too high, should mean they should have generally faster uh, speeds. Uh, all you need is one of their, like, you know, their antennas, which are generally the size of a pizza box and a clear view of the sky, and you should supposedly have internet. It's really easy to ship around and really easy to use. You can operate it off of your phone. And there's currently like 25,000 units operating in Ukraine. And these things have been used to operate drones. These things have been used to operate tons of equipment and communication, help with reestablishing communication in Kherson because all the infrastructure was destroyed and gutted by the Russians. And so it's been extremely helpful. But the problem is um, that Elon Musk's position on Ukraine is absolutely fucking asinine. Is and uh, Elon Putin esque, one might say. It is, it's, it is Putin-esque. And, you know, there was even a report from one reporter, this is something that Elon denied, that he actually had a call with Putin. No, I, I that... fully believe that, 100%. I believe that. You know why? Why do you believe it? Um, because he referred to, I think he referred to, like, um, some kind of political autonomy given to Ukraine as Khrushchev's mistake. Uh, no, no Westerner, no Westerner would ever refer to something like that as Khrushchev's mistake. Only a Russian the... would. I bet that, was, the other that thing, term was given to him or described to him by Putin, and then he just aped it because he's stupid and didn't realize that it wouldn't be, like, a normal smart guy thing to say. You know what else was weird? He mentioned in the replies as to, like, why we should have a vote in these, in these areas that Russia has invaded. Another vote, uh, after their fraudulent vote, is because, you know, these areas voted for Yanukovych in 2012 elections. And I'm looking at this when he posted this, and what, number one, why the fuck does he know about the 2012 Ukrainian elections? And number two, why does he think that this proves that there needs to be a referendum on joining Russia in these areas after the fraudulent one? Just because you voted for Yanukovych does not mean you support joining Russia. If I supported a party that was sympathetic to Canada, that doesn't mean that I want to be Canadian, eh? Yeah, the so funny thing I, is that really reaffirms the narrative that Yanukovych was a Russian puppet leader. The idea that like, oh, well, voting for him implicitly means, nah, in reality, right, like when, when Ukrainian independence was on the table, like you have voting proportions for every district, and the only one that hit 50-50 in terms of whether they wanted to be independent was, um, was uh, um, uh, Crimea, and every other area, including areas of the Donbass, were at least like 75-25 in favor of independence. Absolutely, and there's no polling data that can dispute that. And, and the thing is, like, I just, fuck, man. I really don't know um, what the future of Starlink is because there's been reports of like communication outages and what was like 6% of these like Starlinks um, because of a, a lack of a lack of pay and like Elon wanted to get paid for this. But I also want to make clear like Elon hasn't been paying for all of Starlink. It's been paid largely by the United States, the UK, 
Ukraine, Everything like gets individual subsidized. donors, mm -hmm. like not every now a, a portion of it is donated, but the idea that like they've been paying all the way is not true. They haven't been paying all the way. Other actors have been paying as well. So like the question is, and this is, and like people can go watch the video to see like me tie it all together and show footage, incredible footage of like um, these reporters like actually like covering their car in mud. Because if it shines too much, it'll be like a bigger target for the Russians. I got some, and I have some interesting background footage as I talk about this issue. But the main thing I want to get at with this is that um, Elon Musk is very, very influential in a lot of areas, and I know people are really distracted with Twitter right now. But he's also talking about actively cutting off Starlink if it's used in areas in Crimea. He's talking about using his influence as a billionaire to affect whether or not. Ukraine can win the war in this way when they already have the ability and he'll literally say no you cannot go further than here like yeah. that is that is a tremendous amount for one human being through their wealth to influence and it's a good thing a good thing that he got that he got and donated this stuff to you and helped Ukraine in this way not all of it because a lot of it was paid for um even if like prices for Starlink just doubled in Ukraine and they increased the subscription fee even with all that like it's still a good thing that he did but I, they, they, that good thing was not done on the under the auspices of like Elon Musk is now going to control Ukrainian foreign policy. To yeah, I love how the government is like multiple governments can contribute the finances necessary to maintain a private humanitarian expedition, but ultimately control still resides in that one private guy who can then just recede it at will. It's it's so obviously like Elon Musk, much like Donald Trump, just wants good boy PogChamp applause from audiences. So he thought he could be a superhero by giving Starlink. And then, like, he got talked to by a bunch of far-right people in Putin. And he was like, oh, wait, actually, hold on. Wait, 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 wait. I actually have strongly held ideological convictions that tell me that we shouldn't, you know, use it past this point. It, like, the heel turn from him was insanely quick. Um, and I fucking knew what happened. Dude, to I, I talk about it in the video. I talk about it in the video. He had somebody put up... He, the, the, the city government of Odessa put up a... Pub billboard with his face on it and they actually after he started making these posts they actually tore down the fucking billboard they just they tore it down no more they had to nice. tear it down because they're like it said thank you elon and they got rid of it immediately like never mind and they had like a ukrainian ambassadors responding to him like fuck you motherfucker like really like just going off on him they were not happy when he started making those comments about crimea like i just the thing is like now it's like now that ukraine is heavily reliant on the structure now it's when he's like, okay, now let's change exactly when and where you're allowed to go this far in the war and not go this far in the war. Like, come on, like you should have you should have made these kind of like statements clearer earlier on in the war if you're gonna like make them reliant on you. Yeah, well that would that would have required him to go in with a plan other than the Pogchamp applause, followed by being told by Putin not to. Like, and uh, I want to be fair though, like he deserves credit. Like he he's doing a good thing. Starlink's been very helpful. Like I I've seen it like firsthand be used by these people. I know a lot of people right now who are relying on Starlink. It's very helpful. But like we cannot be playing like like a uh, jump rope with this lifeline for Ukrainians, which is used by like hospital staff all the way down to soldiers, all the way down to random grandmas in the middle of nowhere, who that's the only way they can contact their family while they live in their war zone. And so like. I just want to make sure that no matter what, even if it requires the diversification of Ukraine's internet infrastructure, any of these things, that like people concentrate on making sure that this this the service either stays or if it's going to fade out with time, it's it, it be replaced. We cannot have more outages like we had a few months ago. God willing, uh, they're able to nationalize it sometime soon. Well, it's interesting because like Starlink has their own system of satellites. So it would be very difficult for I think like Ukraine to develop their own system like at this like this rate. No, so no, 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 they no. Have to I, be mean, on I mean nationalize it, not replace it. Oh, so they just they just take the the antenna. How are they gonna do this? How are they gonna take the satellites? How are they gonna make them service the service the antenna? I mean, we broadly, you know. Um, oh, if, we if, just like hold a gun to their head. Well, well hold on. <laughs> Nationalization is a is a time honored and well tested strategy of keeping irresponsible billionaires from, from completely controlling the public life. How about? Not likely to happen, Ukraine, I admit. Let's, um, but it let's would give be... Ukraine NASA. How about that? Um, they can use NASA satellites. That's fine by me. Yeah, I'd go for it. NASA is my favorite um, Nazi employing organization. Oh, have you met anyone from uh, Azov while, while out there? 
Um, probably. I don't, I didn't, I mean, I saw Azov, some, A, Azov symbology is everywhere because people see them as like the heroes of Mariupol, you know? Mm. They're like, they've become very big since that. Um, but nobody cares about them or politics. They just care that they're good soldiers. Like the political party of Azov is like a complete failure. The, the real, the, I have seen one person I know for sure is a Nazi. Second person I suspect is a Nazi. Um, and that one person I, I, I know is a Nazi was a right sector guy. He had the right sector tattoo on his neck. Those guys scare the fuck out of me. They scare me more than the average Azov guy. Um, because it's like, it's like white nationalist prison culture stuff. They're so cool. Which is like, um, the right, they got, he had the tattoo on his neck and he just looked like a German soldier. It almost looked like he just dressed up like a German soldier. Like he had like, a, it looked like an old German World War II hat. He had like an SS symbol. Like he had the SS, like the SS markings on his medical bag. Um, like he was just like straight Next up, message. like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who, who, who knows who this guy, be- what this guy believes? He didn't really, um, he didn't really talk at all to me uh, or anything, but he was like, he was just there. He was just there. Yeah, he gave, I... me, a, he gave me a Snickers bar, <laughs> which I, which I was like in the, I was in the forest. And he, yeah, he gave me a Snickers bar, and I didn't see like, any, like I didn't see the. The fucking thing on his bag and the hat. I was just like, oh, a Snickers bar, because I was distracted with, you know, the war. And then afterwards, I was looking at the footage, and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Was that a racist Snickers bar? Am I racist now? And ever ever since then, I've now had have had to fight the racist Snickers. That is incredibly funny. Yeah, I know, um, I, I know, I know the Azov shit is like, it's it, it, like you have some uh, some neo Nazis who run a local militia, and not all the people in it are themselves neo Nazis. Just you know, a lot of them. Um, and at this point now, they're basically just you know more cannon fodder into the interminable conflict. You know, Ukraine needs all the soldiers they can get. Um, the funny thing is that like despite despite the Azov guys' efforts to get noticed, because like every time there's like a, a picture of Ukrainian soldiers, somebody has a fucking Black Sun or SS or whatever on them, because the, the the Azov guys are always trying to muscle in on the cameras to to rep themselves. But in terms, of, in spite of all that, like um, Ukraine is like the least Hitlerized fucking country in the West right now in terms of actual political power. You know, you go you yeah, the, go west. You don't there, have like, any political influence. Yeah, yeah a lot of us. Wait, wait, wait. This is this is the best way I like to put it. Um, I think this is how it was put, generally speaking, to me by an Arab Ukrainian that I know. Mm-hmm. Very cool guy. He actually designed my logo, my new channel logo. I'm trying to hire as much Ukrainian labor in all my efforts as possible. Oh. Um, the he described to me like they have the the fascists have no political power really. They have extreme amounts of aesthetic power. Yeah, they're they're like goofy mascots over there, you know. As opposed to the United States, where we don't have very many people in overt Nazi imagery, like, relatively, but one half of our political electorate is open allies to people who dress up in fatigues and, like, seek heil outside of uh, drag shows. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's it's really like an aesthetic over-reality, like, line, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think I think a hundred. I think a lot of it is like a lot of it will just be like these are the guys who fought Russia, so I'm gonna do it. Like I'm gonna wear this. A lot of them are just like legit neo Nazis, like the people who wear that shit. Um, but a lot of it is just like weird aesthetic fucking fascism, and I don't understand it. Um, I it feels a little bit like when I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. Almost like I really don't know how to describe it. I think a lot of it is just dumb, uh, dumb, ignorant people who just don't know the, uh, like the history of these symbols. But I think, I, but there's never an excuse to be wearing these symbols, even if it's if it's done out of ignorance. And there still are legit Nazis, and like we, I don't think we should downplay it. But like overall, there's still like what zero point two to three yeah, percent. Well, yeah, no, the, like you military. said, it's it's like image over substance. Um, the the the, the neo Nazis in Ukraine make an active effort to overrepresent themselves probably to compensate for the fact that they're giga cucked right now because they're fighting for a Jewish controlled liberal democracy against a fascist empire. Um, and they're dying to do it as well. So like the cope that they get is like flashing their lightning bolts to, to the cameras that show up. Um, and there are probably people who like, you know, sort of fall in with that without actually like believing in the ideology, kind of the way that a lot of prison gangs have white supremacist, um, imagery but not every individual member of them is white supremacist and in terms of political power like you said they're 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 totally emaciated compared to like even countries like france you know, or whatever 
Um, you know what I compare? You know what it, Azov most reminds me of in its current state? What? It reminds me of Marie Le Pen's kind of political party. A little bit. Well, much less powerful in terms of, like, influence. Yeah, no, not, I'm not an influence, but when it comes to, like, its ideology... You know the history of Marine Le Pen's political party. It's just, like, literally has neo-Nazi roots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, the, a lot of her, political like, parties in, like, Europe, yeah. Europe have, like, neo-Nazi roots, and then it, like, slowly dilutes their, their values. To, where they're still like, oh, fuck, what the fuck's wrong with you? I'm never going to join your party. Oh, my God. But it's not the same as the origin. It still has made changes where they had to adapt to a, be able to appeal to some, like, normality. And that's what it feels like Like some of the, like, transformations Azov went through. Like, it, I think a big, a big change was the like banning of like foreign fighters with Azov when they had to like integrate it and stuff like that that you had to be a citizen to be part of Azov that was like a big thing because it like stopped like international white nationalists using it to like train and stuff like that but like it still has like a far-right problem and that's not something anybody can deny yeah well um happy to see but let me tell you when you talk to Anna about this she's she's gonna be passionate right right uh uh, pro banderite Anna right uh, she's not. She's not Bandera. It's just like fuck. It, she has the. She has the belief about this, like most Ukrainians do, which like these people are our heroes. They're here dying. They're here suffering. Uh, nobody else is doing it for us. They did it when nobody else would. That's, Look, that's, I'm okay that's with. I'm okay with neo Nazis dying for a good cause. In fact, that's the best thing they could <laughs> possibly be doing. You say uh, yeah, it's gonna piss her off. What? <laughs> I, I, I agree. Head. I fully agree with the the premise. Because you're calling them neo Nazis, and that's something that really pisses her off. Well, there are certainly neo Nazis in the Azov Battalion. Absolutely, there absolutely are. There absolutely are. All right, I can I can see. I'm. I'll talk about it with her when I when I talk with her. Um. You know, we'll 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 resolve that schism when we get there. The the Banderite schism. Um, it has been a delight to talk to you. Uh, you awesome. know, I'm I'm very glad that you're alive. Hopefully, that's a persistent trait that'll continue indefinitely into the future, at least for for a good few decades. Hey, hey, but if I do go, if it does happen, you got to watch Bebop uh, for my memorial stream. I'll pour one out for you as I watch it. I'll pour one out Thank every you. one of the twenty four episodes. Thank you. Thank you. I thought it was 26. It's, I, I was guessing. I just knew it was two seasons. Um, really, though, it's been a delight talking to you. Um, you can shout yourself out or I can. Which would you prefer? I'll shout myself out. Um, right now, like my all my YouTube game content is coming out slowly but surely, as well as some video essays on Dylan Burns TV. That's my main channel. But I'm really pushing for my daily up to daily upload content, two videos a day. My second channel, Dylan Burns Live, and I also have a Twitter, Dylan Burns seventeen seventy six, that you can follow. Instagram, Dylan Burns TV, Discord as well. Um, a million different things. But a big thing I want to push right now also is my Patreon, Dylan Burns TV on Patreon, because I, um, you know, like I talked about earlier, it's really expensive to do this type of work. And uh, if I'm going to take breaks from streaming to do more of this, I need to be able to invest in it. And I need to be able to know that, like, I have some finances for myself to be able to live. And plus, hiring cameraman and stuff like that in a war zone is very expensive because people don't get shot at for cheap. And I also, you know, I, I just need to feed myself. So if you guys could, you know, support that, I'd appreciate that as well. But just support me wherever. And um, if, if you can't do that, I don't know, go gift the sub to Hassan. You know, I want to help you know, make sure that we have our, our next president of the United States ready to go. Don't give the sub to Hassan. Give the sub to Dylan Burns. I can't believe you would even... Give the sub to Hassan! Have a what? Hey, you, you, you think pushing this here is going to get you in on his stream? Okay, you've got no, to be no, a no, no, no. I'm, I'm already. I'm, I am blocked by Hassan, and I'm banned from his Discord. I'm are you never, blocked you know, on his Twitter? Stream. I'm blocked and banned from his Discord. Wait, are you wait, are you blocked from him on Twitter or, or Yes. I'm blind I'm blocked from him by on Twitter, yes. What the fuck? Why? Because it was I think it's because I criticized his take on Taiwan once. And I also uh... criticized his take on the Crimean Bridge explosion. I said it I said it wasn't a civilian target. I said it was absolutely was a military target. And I was very, and I was critical of that. And I think that was that's what got me banned from the Discord. Um the Twitter block I think was probably Taiwan. I, he's an emotional guy. I, if it makes you feel any better, I'm banned from his Discord as well. Wow, wait, you're banned? Actually? What for? His mod team despises me. I actually don't know what for. They just hate me. Yeah. I mean, Hassan thinks I'm a, like a, new, a ruthless neoliberal shell. Of course, uh, of so, course, you know, he's, exact, Well, you, well, you are, word, you are so. making friends with, with, uh, with Banderite legionnaires. True. Like, I, I am, I am a ba- Biden Banderite. I'm bringing a new, I'm going to bring back a new radical ideology to America. You're, the thing is, before we asked you to get vaccinated, we're not asking anymore, buddy. Yeah, I'm, I'm a radical centrist. That is to say, I'm a centrist between being a Banderite and an IRA member. Somewhere in the middle, 
is a perfectly politically centrist militant. Um, and I'm that's where I black am. And red. <laughs> My gosh, that's actually a terrifying combination. That'd be fucking hilarious, actually. I, um, I really appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate you um, uh, talking to me. I appreciate you continuing to support Ukraine. And um, I appreciate you like hosting me and continuing to like keep you on your channel. Your community is always very supportive of me. Um, and I probably wouldn't be doing the type of work I'm doing right now if it wasn't for uh, my connections with people uh, like you, who gave me a platform originally when I was still, uh, you know, with the Gravel and everything like that. My so audience I really appreciate will always that. hold you in high regard. They will all. <laughs> that's something you say before, like the villain arc, man. Before I like take the villain arc, like it's like you're talking about, like, oh, Anakin, you will always be, you will always be a f fantastic buddy. Like, you never I have know. a surprisingly permissive audience. If they've managed to stick with me, I have a feeling they're going to uh, continue to be supportive of the comparatively far more impressive stuff you're doing. Sure, okay. I, then I will not do a Banderite coup in the United States and ruin my reputation. Yeah, if I see, if I see you wearing, um, Azov insignia and any have you seen wait have you seen my tattoo and how people call me a Nazi because of it no wait hold on don't wait you want to see it and... I don't know if it'll come up I'll but look... I'll I'll send it to you wait hold on this looks like your neck <laughs> no it's not, no 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 it's not my neck one second let me let your me chest it to you. uh it's on my back oh wait now how oh wait this is from two years ago this is a meme or is it not a meme it's just an old tattoo um I have. I, it's not mine. Here, let me send it to you. Mother drug. Let me send it to you. Thing? Okay. There's the tattoo. You see the Z on the... <laughs> oh, that's dope! Thank you. Wow, I can't believe that oh, you... Oh, the other one. You you've like the ripped one the exclusively Nazi iconography of skulls. I was actually about to play Doom uh, later tonight and, um, and celebrate the Nazi imagery in Doom because of the skulls. One second. You're gonna like this. That looks dope like this. as hell. Thank you very much. It was designed by a Ukrainian. Uh, I, it's, it's not surprising, isn't this the? Yeah. Isn't this the emblem? Um. Yeah, yeah. That's an national. I mean, the, the the whole tattoo was redesigned by him for me, custom. I really appreciated it. What's the name of the emblem? Um, the the trident. It's the Ukrainian trident, and then it has the Z. Ukrainian. Skull. Here's the other. Here's the other one. You're gonna like this one. Right. Guess what? Guess what? That's from. There it is. Yeah. Okay. I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, wait. Stalker. Yep. Oh God. But I the recognize thing is, that. I've played these games. The thing is, though, I I wanted to get Stalker on my arm, but then I realized it would make me look like I got marked as a sex offender, so I had to get it in Ukrainian and <laughs> <in> Russian. <laughs> yeah, but but it's a game reference. It's a game reference. Please, 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 <laughs> please. no, please, I'm not following you. Yeah. L l hey, check out check out this sweet tattoo I got. Points to back. Pedophile. It's a game reference. It's, it's a game reference. You favorite, don't understand. My favorite video game. I, guys. <laughs> um, no, yeah. Fuck. Are people giving you shit over the stalker tattoo? I feel Dude, like... If you... I, look, look if, it was, if it was a pedophile tattoo, I'd just be a Genshin Impact player. True. It would be a Vosh reference. Um, True. <laughs> it, you really are living the, um, the stalker dream, right? I mean, you've, you've, have you not literally... You've been like pretty close to Chernobyl, haven't you? Oh, dude, I gotta go to Chernobyl, man. I want to go to Chernobyl so bad. I mean, I've I've been to uh, nuclear possible nuclear disasters in Ukraine. Remember, I went to the I went to the Zaporozhye power plant. Yeah, yeah, I remember the you, Zaporozhye thing. Um, but I do want to film in Chernobyl. I want to film in Chernobyl really, really bad. Okay, just I, don't, I, I don't get too close. Don't, don't, I want to get really close. <laughs> okay, but like I want to go to Priprat. Priprat. The dirt there is spicy. Even all these years after, it's still pretty spicy over there. Yeah, but if you stay in the Red Forest just for a bit, you'll be fine. Then you get out of there. Yeah, if the Russians don't... dug trenches, though. They dug trenches. Yeah, and they're gonna die. <laughs> it's fine if you're there for a bit, as long as you wear a gas mask. If you inhale any of that spicy dust, it's sticking with you. Hey, dude, you know, I'm a spicy guy, you know? I need some spicy takes. All right, if I see a video of you anywhere near the exclusion zone without a uh, gas mask, okay, I'm sicking my audience on you. Is sick in my yeah, they can come to me, then I'll get them irradiated too, and I'll join my cult. I'm gonna do that like you know that thing in um Fallout 3 where they're all worshiping the nuke, whatever it's called. Yeah, 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 yeah. At, at uh at the, the first town, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the Church of Adam. I'm gonna start that. Absolutely. Oh, is that that's wait, is that Fallout 4? That's the um Fallout 4, Fallout 3. It's they, there's multiple people that worship nukes and radiation. It's a recurring theme in the series. Yeah, it's almost i I wonder why. I I'll never understand it. Um, hopefully, hopefully it just sticks to the series and, and nothing past that, you know?
True, true. But I gotta say, make an incredible YouTube video. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Um, uh, soy facing at the end of the world, you know, and it's it's just the, the the thumbnail is a photo of your face silhouetted against the mushroom Dude. cloud as you point back at it like the soy nuggies guys. If I got it out fast enough, I wonder if there would be a period like because the whole world wouldn't blow up at the exact same time because Dukes would be launched. There would be people who would see that thumbnail for that video, be like, "What?" They look out the window and then they just go, "It's gone." That'd be that would be a fantastic end if I could jump scare people with the end of the world. Yeah, that's the magic of Twitter too, because you would there would be like sixty thousand people in Ukraine who would like see like trending local, what the fuck, and then they would look outside and see a blast wave headed towards them at the speed of sound. Yep. Oh God, what <laughs> a terrible! Could you imagine last moment on the shitter on Twitter? Twitter tells you about to die. Boom, gone. I mean, hey, um, at, at least at least they had one final social interaction before they went. Um, that is true. Yeah. That is true. They got a well, warning. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, nuke we'll... jokes aside, really, it's been a delight. Awesome, man. You you have a good one. You keep it up, okay? You keep keeping the steadfast support for Ukraine here at home, and I'll keep doing it uh, over over there, okay, man? And the thanks to the community who have supported me like through this, because uh, like this is a massive change. Like I dropped what was my most successful show to do this. Uh, which came with like a lot of trouble. Um, a lot of like, I had to get rid of like a lot, a lot of people who used to work with me no longer work with me because I just don't, this is not what they signed up for as editors. So I've had a huge changes. So I appreciate all the help from everybody in the community. You guys have been very helpful. They'll continue to take care awesome, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Cool guy. I do strongly encourage you guys to, um, to consume his content really. I host his streams often, but you should be following him on YouTube. The two channels are Dylan Burns TV and Dylan Burns Live. Dylan's done a lot of really good stuff. Seriously, look at this. Under fire, Mikolaev. With the Ukrainian counteroffensive reaching its conclusion with the liberation of the city of Kherson, I want to revisit the start of the counteroffensive. I was in the city of Mykolaiv with two Polish aid workers by the name of Philip and Pavel. Look, these are like fully edited, high quality video essays on the main channel. Uh, with, with, with the... The title is so clickbait coded, but it's not... Yeah, I got shelled by the Russian army. It's like, nice clickbait, but you know, he did, so... 